Thanks for attending today. My name is Elizabeth Calderon. I'm the Senior Food Security Analyst at FuseNet responsible for Central America and the Caribbean. And today I'll be presenting our Central America Food Security Outlook Briefing for the December 2022 to May 2023 period. So today's briefing will begin by providing just a brief overview of FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis and the IPC 3.1 Food Security Classification System. I'll go through our key messages for the outlook period and then provide an overview of some of the recent developments in both our presence country of Guatemala, as well as the remote monitoring countries in Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. We'll review our key assumptions for this outlook period and then go ahead and discuss our projected outcomes through May of 2023. So FUSENET's approach to early warning analysis, what we do is we use an eight-step process called scenario development. We're beginning here with our understanding of local livelihoods and how poor households access food and income. This knowledge base helps us to understand what information from the field we would need, and then we'll draw on and analyze a variety of relevant pieces of information um, in order to, and that would include agroclimatology, markets and trade, and a number of other pieces of information. And we do that to determine first current food security outcomes. From there, we develop evidence-based assumptions about key drivers and anomalies, which help us to project the extent to which poor households, food and income sources are either likely or unlikely to cover their minimum food needs during the projection period. And by minimum food needs, we mean an average of 2,100 kilocalories per day. So we use those, those projections to classify the most likely food security outcomes. And we do that first at the household level and then at the area level, which is what you're used to seeing in our maps. And the last step in the process is that we identify events, which although we don't think that they are likely to happen, they are possible and could change the scenario and our outcomes if they were to happen. And in terms of what food security classification looks like, FuseNet utilizes the global IPC scale. So this scale consists of five phases of increasing severity. And if you look at the top of this slide, you can see those different phases and the colors that are associated with them. They begin with none at the household level or minimal at the area level. This is IPC phase one, and it's seen here in green. And it indicates that households are able to meet their basic food and non-food needs. Uh, phase two, or stressed, which is there in yellow, indicates that households have minimally adequate consumption, but they may be unable to afford essential non-food needs without negative coping. And phases three and higher, which you can see in the dotted box there on the top right of the slide, all of these phases require urgent humanitarian food assistance because households either have food consumption gaps or they're engaging in unsustainable coping strategies in order to mitigate those gaps. So separating out phase by phase, households in crisis or phase three, which is there in orange, are experiencing food consumption gaps that are reflected by high or above normal acute malnutrition, or they're only minimally meeting their food needs through negative coping that essential livelihood assets. Emergency or IPC phase four, which is the lighter of the two reds, is more severe. And this is where households have large food consumption gaps reflected in really high acute malnutrition and excess mortality. Or they may be mitigating those gaps through employing emergency co uh, livelihood coping strategies, including asset liquidation. Lastly, the most severe phase is the dark red and its catastrophe at the household level or famine at the area level. And this indicates an extreme lack of food and other basic needs, even after full employment of all coping strategies. We would see in this phase evidence of death, destitution, and extremely critical acute malnutrition levels. But as a reminder for the Central America region, we're typically seeing a combination of phases one, two, and three at the household level. Now, as we go from the household level classification, which is at the top of the slide, to the area level classification, which is at the bottom of this slide, we um, would note that we need to see at least 20% of a given area's population meeting the criteria for a particular phase in order for that area to be classified into that phase. But we do recognize that there's likely households experiencing different phases within that same area. So an example of this is if you look into the middle of the slide for the area level classification for crisis on the bottom, you can see there that actually most of the households, or not most, but quite a number are meeting or close to meeting all of their food needs. 
at least 20% of them are in phase three or higher, which would result in that area being classified in phase three. I do also want to point out here that phase three classification can look really different in different contexts. There may be either higher or lower percentages of households facing those outcomes. And in some instances, you might see households facing worse outcomes, such as the example here showing one household in IPC phase four, but that's not necessarily the case. The last thing to note in our mapping and classification is that FuseNet places an exclamation point in a given area to indicate that ongoing or programmed humanitarian food assistance is mitigating food security outcomes in that area and that without it, the classified phase would likely be at least one phase worse. Okay, so going to Central America, our key messages for this outlook period. Seasonal increases in the availability of staple grains for producing households and income generating activities are allowing the majority of poor households across the region to experience improvements in their food security. Despite these improvements though, households will still struggle to cover their non-food needs as they continue to recover from previous shocks and cope with above average prices. This is resulting in stressed or IPC phase two outcomes. In addition, pockets of households in crisis or IPC phase three still exist in all four countries of the region. This is driven by atypically high prices, localized crop losses, and lingering impacts from previous shocks. Now, some areas of the Eastern Dry Corridor, Western Altiplano, and Alta Verapaz in Guatemala are expected to remain in crisis or IPC phase three throughout the outlook period as households in these areas, recent income from labor demand for commercial crops has not been sufficient to prevent their use of negative coping strategies. Anticipating the continuation of high food prices in a typically high market dependence, the population in crisis or IPC phase three is expected to increase progressively with the start of the annual lean season. The annual lean season is likely to begin slightly early this year in February or March for worst affected households, but it is expected that most of the region remains stressed through May. National pastrera harvests are continuing to flow into markets while the maize harvest from the only production cycle of staple grains in the Altiplano in Guatemala began in, in December. This will increase the availability of staple grains through February and allow for some slight productions in prices, but prices will remain above last year and above average. Although the harvest is expected to be below average for subsistence farmers given uh, agricultural input prices, it will still increase household reserves and slightly reduce their dependence on the market for a period of time. In central Nicaragua and to a lesser extent along the Atlantic and Honduras, the Aponte cycle also began in December and weather conditions are favorable for this cycle with the harvest coming out around February or March. Lastly, despite the arrival of these harvests, prices of maize and beans remain mostly stable across the region between October and November, but they're atypically high compared to last year and the five-year average. This trend is due to a combination of factors, including speculation after the passage of tropical storm Julia in October because of greater regional demand, increased production costs, and also above average headline inflation this year. In November, in an interannual headline inflation showed mixed trends across the region with reported rates at 7.3, 9.2, 10.4, and 11.4% for El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, respectively. In December, households usually see seasonal increases in income, which will partially offset the sharp increases in prices, but high food and transportation costs will continue to pressure household purchasing power in the coming months and limit food access. So with that, we'll take a look at some of the recent developments, and I'll go back all the way to October in order to provide some context there. But first, we'll take a look at the region's seasonal calendar. And so between October and December, both the hurricane season and the second rainy season begin to taper off. Postura planting wraps up in October and harvest begin in November and continue into December. And Aponte planting takes part in December with harvests occurring early in the following year. From October through March is when we see peak demand for unskilled labor, and this is an important source of income for a lot of households across the region. The income earned during this time is usually helped to help households um, cope throughout the annual lean season, and that annual lean season typically lasts from April to August. At the tail end of our projection period, if you look sort of in the middle of our slide here, 
uh, you can see that the first rainy season will begin, and with that also comes planting for the primera season. So looking at this year's harvest first. So we did see average to above average rainfall during both rainy seasons. And with that, we saw staple grains developing really well across the region in both the Primera and Postera seasons. So on the left on this slide here, you can see average uh, vegetative health in early September, which is around the Primera harvest. And on the right, about the same um, for Postera, which was measured in early November, just before the harvest for that season. Nationally, harvests for both seasons were reported to be about near average, especially for surplus and commercial farmers. But for subsistence farmers, really high and above average fertilizer prices caused them to decrease fertilizer use as well as reduce cropped areas. And this resulted in lower than normal yields and harvests for this particular group. For example, I would share that in one of the worst affected areas of Guatemala in Altavera Paz, damaged soils from hurricanes Ada and Iota from 2020, combined with um, the issues that we saw this year in very low access to fertilizer and some crop damages, which I'll get into here momentarily. So those things combined together uh, to result in subsistence farmers in this area reporting that they were only able to produce about 100 pounds of maize per cuerda. The cuerda is a, a size of a, a piece of land that's a little bit smaller than an acre. Um, but you compare that to the amount that these farmers were able to produce prior to the 2020 hurricanes. Um, before that time, farmers might have been able to produce between five and 700 pounds of maize on that same plot of land. So despite the generally positive plant growth, though, we did see erratic rainfall distribution. And we saw that during both seasons, and it caused heavy rainfall and winds as well as localized crop damage. Soil moisture conditions, which you're seeing here in the graph on the left, were above average in several parts of the region, and this led to some increased probabilities of flooding and landslides. The passage of Tropical Storm Julia in early October, which you can see here on the right, um, this negatively affected the areas where soils were already well saturated, and excess rainfall, which is shown there in the graph in some of those blue colors and in that really vibrant pink, um, that that excess rainfall resulted in some localized crop damage and loss. Now, again, here subsistence farmers were the most affected as maize crops were either drying in the fields at the time the storm hit, or they had already been harvested but were in the process of drying in or around their homes. In addition, there were reports of damages and losses in recently planted bean fields for the Prostrera cycle and some deterioration of highways, roads, and bridges. So here we can see evidence of some of the flooding of maize fields in the picture on the left, and then damage to bean crops in the middle and on the right. These were shared by our science partners um, just in the immediate aftermath of Julia in Guatemala. And here on the left, this is what we mean when we say maize was left to dry in the field. So this was taken in a field in El Salvador in early October in an area that did not see flooding. But so you can see in this picture pretty clearly how the maize is folded over to dry and then left where it is. Whereas in the middle of the slide, you can see an example from Guatemala where a household would dry maize in or around their house. So it's easy to understand how households and fields which flooded would have seen late season or post harvest losses in some of those worst impacted areas. And then on the right, we can see an example of some damaged maize in Guatemala. Now, even with these losses, as I mentioned before, national level harvests were near average, which normally would allow for a seasonal decline in prices. But this year, we really haven't seen much in terms of declining prices. Prices are remaining well above average. In the graph here on the left, you can see that prices for maize have come down slightly or they've been remaining pretty stable in most countries since about the release of the Primera harvest in September. But in the graph on the right, you can see that maize prices remain between almost 20 and almost 50% higher than last year, and between about 50 and 80% higher than the five-year average. We can see similar trends for bean prices as well. So there have been some spikes in bean prices though, which bucks that seasonal trend, more in Nicaragua and to a lesser extent in Honduras. And in those two countries, this was due to speculation following the passage of Tropical Storm Julia. You can see those price trends here on the left. And then on the right, you can see that Guatemala has had the least variation in bean prices, with this year's prices less than 20% above last year, 
and less than 40% above the five-year average. But if you look across the rest of the region, prices are really a lot higher than that, up to more than 100% variation over last year in the five-year average in Nicaragua. High production and transportation costs, as well as regional demand increases, are playing a role in these above average prices. And both inflation and both headline and food inflation have really remained stubbornly high across the region. But uh, the steep increases in headline inflation that we saw earlier this year are thankfully finally leveling off or beginning to decline in most of the region. You can see that here in the graph on the left. We have seen some similar trends in food inflation with the exception of Guatemala, which has not yet seen a decline in their food inflation rates. And that is shown here in the graph on the right. But still, the economies of the region have seen um, significant economic recovery since the height of the pandemic. And this is evidenced by GDP growth rates, which are shown here in the graph on the left. The World Bank has forecasted largely stable growth rates for the region all the way into 2024, but we would note that there has been some moderation of growth expectations by the World Bank earlier this year, mostly due to the fact that inflation has muted recovery in some sectors, and we have seen somewhat of a decline in exports in the region. Central America has also continued to benefit from an increase in remittances over pre-pandemic years. You can see that here in the graph on the right, and this is particularly the case in Guatemala. It's helped to bolster incomes for receiving households, but receiving households are not typically our poorer households. Still, for those that do receive them, the middle and better off households, they will tend to increase their spending in their communities and in some instances hire more labor, so there can be an indirect benefit to uh, poorer households. And the other key factor currently ongoing is a peak for peak demand for unskilled labor. And this rises, again, as I mentioned, uh, between October and February following seasonal trends. It supports increases in household incomes. Income from most cash crop labor this year, that includes sugar, African palm, bananas, and then large coffee plantations. It's reportedly average across the region, including in Mexico. And that's despite there being some localized damages due to uh, Tropical Storm Julia. In the graph on the left, you can see many of the areas that see some of the highest demand for labor for coffee. And in some areas, we do have reports that tight labor markets with below average labor supply have uh, resulted in some modest increases in daily wage rates. So the exception, though, is that demand for local manual labor for both small and medium sized coffee production, as well as for cardamom production, are currently below average. This is due in part to efforts to reduce production costs, and as well as the case of cardamom, it's due to depressed international sales prices. Okay, so turning now to our key assumptions through May of 2023, continuing current trends through the conclusion of peak demand for unskilled labor, average income is expected for most cash crop opportunities, while below average income is expected for manual labor locally and in some small and medium sized coffee production. The Primera 2023 rainy season is forecasted to be average, which will likely allow for the timely start of planting for staple grains in April or May. We have recently seen an increased likelihood of below average rainfall in some parts of the region between March to May, which you can see here in the map on the right, um, but it is not expected to negatively impact the start of the 2023 Primera season. Fertilizer prices will remain, <clears throat> excuse me, above average following international trends, causing a drop in cropped areas for small producers. Now, this is likely to be pretty similar to what we experienced in 2022, where small producers reduced their cropped areas, but national production remained average. Agricultural labor demand for planting and preparation activities for the 2023 Primera season is likely to be below average, but similar to 2022 due to persistently high production costs driven by high agricultural input prices. And in line with broader economic trends, non-agricultural employment, informal work, as well as tourism are all likely to continue improving, but will remain slightly below pre-pandemic levels due to inflation and constraints on businesses' ability to hire labor. Remittances will likely continue to be above last year and above the five-year average, which will continue to boost local economies. Although a sharp, the sharp rises that we saw in international fuel prices have now subsided, they are expected to remain above average through May, 
reflected in higher food prices and headline inflation throughout the region. Headline inflation is likely to remain stable across the region as we've seen in the past several months, but will remain well above average and likely exceed at least 5%. Fusenet price projections for staple grains show a seasonal rise between or beginning in March and April, which is when local harvest flows will come to an end. But prices will remain well above the five-year average throughout the analysis period as seen here in the graphs on the right. What we're looking at here in the top graph is showing the percent increase of projected May 2023 prices for maize over last year's prices, and that's shown in the red bars, and then over the five-year average, which is shown in the blue bars. And the bottom graph is showing those same projected percent increases, but for prices in beans. And lastly, we would note that given both recent and current shocks, we do anticipate that worst affected households, particularly those in Guatemala and Honduras, are likely to experience an atypically early start to the annual lean season, around March. All right, and bringing that all together, here we have our projected food security outcomes from December to January on the left and from February to May on the right. I would note here that FuseNet does have a remote monitoring posture in Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. So the outlines that you see here are in these countries are indicating that at least one area is facing the phase indicated. So breaking it down a little bit more here, in urban areas across the region, minimal or IPC phase one is expected throughout the outlook period, and that's given the continued recovery of the region's economies. But in rural areas, even though incomes remain stable and most households have had at least some grain reserves from recent harvests, the costs of living have risen really sharply, and this has been reducing poor households' purchasing power. So to cover their food needs, they are needing to adjust the quality and diversity of foods included in their diets, as well as cut back on non-essential expenditures and on health and food expenses. Now, this is resulting in stressed or IPC phase two outcomes for most rural areas throughout the outlook period. In February and March, seasonal demand for manual labor and overall income levels will start to reduce. And as grain reserves run out, households will need to depend more on the market in the face of really high food and transportation prices. This is also going to happen just at the same time that prices will begin to see some seasonal increases and will result in an even further reduction in household purchasing power. Now, given the shocks that households are facing, we do anticipate that some additional households and some additional areas will begin to experience crisis or IPC phase three outcomes with the progression of the lean season as they begin employing more severe coping strategies. These coping strategies could include reducing the quantity of food, selling productive assets, and undertaking atypical migration. Although the worst area level outcomes for Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua are expected to be stressed or IPC phase two, again, that results in the, the IPC phase two classifications for the entire country in those countries. I do want to really mention here that we are anticipating some amount of households within all three countries to experience crisis or IPC phase three outcomes during the projection period. This is likely to be particularly the case in areas that experienced excess rainfall and flooding following the passage of Tropical Storm Julia. And we've listed some of the areas of our greatest concern here at the bottom of the slide. Now, most affect, I'm sorry, worst affected areas of the Eastern Dry Corridor, Western and Western Altiplano in Guatemala, are expected to face crisis or IPC phase three outcomes for the duration of the outlook period. And this is due in these areas uh, to the fact that poor households have been incurring significant debts and they have produced below average volumes of staple grains in recent years. And this has forced their prolonged dependence on markets. Meanwhile, in Altavera Paz, soil degradation from the 2020 hurricanes, Ada and Iota, have been exacerbated this year by flooding and the tropical storm Julia, along with extremely high agricultural input prices, have really significantly reduced yields and harvests for producing households. Now, in all three of these areas, the temporary rise in their income during peak demand for unskilled labor was not enough for them to be able to fully restore their livelihoods, repay debts or improve their diets. And so we do anticipate they will continue to cut back on food quantity, they will take on unsustainable debt and resort to atypical migration or selling productive assets.
And with that, I'd just like to remind everybody that our latest reports and key message updates on Guatemala, as well as the remote monitoring countries for Central America, can all be found on our website. And I just would like to thank everyone for their time and attention this afternoon. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have.